Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Karthik Shait, and I'm a co-chair for the NASA headquarters, Asian American and Pacific Islanders Employee Resource Group. On behalf of our leadership team and the happy ERG, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our flagship event for AAPI Heritage Month, the month of May. This event is being recorded for future broadcast on NASA TV. And I would just like to take a few moments to have our leadership team maybe take 30 seconds and introduce themselves to the community before we introduce our introduced our panel. So let me turn it over to my co-chair, Gemma Ford. Hello. Uh Welcome. Um, my name is Gemma Flores and I'm a Filipino American. Uh, my mom immigrated to the US, specifically New York in the 70s through a nurse exchange program. That's where she met my and married my dad, also from the Philippines, and they had me, um, though I mostly grew up in Southern California. Uh, in NASA, I'm originally from uh, the Armstrong Flight Research Center, and I was there for about 15 years, and now I work for headquarters, been there for about a year and a half, working in the Office of Strategic Infrastructure. Uh, my, role, um, my role is to serve as the Agency Master Planning Program Manager, and in this role, I get to work with the mission directorates to develop an agency facility strategy that aligns with the mission and goals of the agency's strategic plan. Um, like Kardik mentioned, um, I also co-chair the headquarters AAPI uh, ERG Employee Research Group and want to extend my gratitude and true excitement for your willingness uh, to share and have a discussion about your journey. Uh, so, now, so now I'll pass it on to Misty Snopkowski for her uh, intro. Thanks, Gemma. Hi, everybody. I'm excited about today. Uh, my name is Misty Snopkowski. Um, I was born in the Philippines. Uh, my dad was stationed out there uh, for the Navy, and he met my mom. Um, so I am a military brat. I, I grew up all over, um, but my hometown is Buffalo, New York. Um, so I am half Filipino and half Polish. So people like see my name, and then they meet me, and they're kind of confused. But that's uh, <laughs> that's my background. Um, I'm uh, the new program exec for the Commercial Leo Development Program in HEO. Um, I actually, I just started the position this past January, um, so it's an exciting new program. We actually just had a press briefing this morning to announce our first private astronaut mission um, with Axiom, so that's all good stuff. Um, and then I'm also the communications rep for the headquarters um, AAPI ERG, so um, when you see notes and stuff, uh, it usually comes from me. Um, obviously all of us, but I'm the one that you'll probably see in your inbox um, getting the emails from. So uh, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to today's panel and I'll pass it on to Nina. Thank you, Misty, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nina Wang and I am half Vietnamese, half Chinese. Um, my parents actually met working at a Chinese restaurant in Pennsylvania. Um, and then they moved to Virginia for my dad's engineering career. And then, so that's where my sister and I were born and raised, um, been here all, all of our lives. Um, I'm currently an accountant in the CFO office, and I am also the secretary rep for the Happy ERG. And, you know, just wanted to echo what everyone else was saying that I really appreciate Mimi, Bavia, and Kay um, meeting us today and sharing their experiences with um, the AAPI community here at NASA. So I will now pass it off to Charo. Thank you, Nina. Good afternoon, everybody. Charo Esper. Uh, I'm an Indian American. I was born in India and moved here to Maryland when I was 14. Uh, I started, of course, uh, my high school and college here. Went to University of Maryland College Park. Go Terps. Uh, I started my career in consulting. Uh, I was in consulting for 15 years. Uh, specifically mainly with IBM, and that's where I was really grateful and fortunate to work with NASA as a client uh, back in the day. That was 10 years ago. Uh, one of my favorite memories of was supporting and leading uh, change as a change lead for uh, the shuttle retirement at Johnson Space Center. Um, so this is almost homecoming for me. I joined NASA uh, two years ago, uh, mm -hmm. and of course, prior to that, like I said, I was still in federal uh, for about seven years. Currently, my role is the deputy for uh, culture and workforce uh, transformation within digital transformation. This is one of the major initiatives that's happening at NASA right now, really looking at uh, where we're headed next 
through our private partnerships and where we want to be as NASA as a whole. So really excited to be here. Thank you, everyone. Like I said, as a panel members and echo uh, that feedback. With that, I will hand it over to Karthik. Karthik, you on mute, please. Uh, of course I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Charu. So, uh, like Charu, I also immigrated to the United States when I was 14, uh, and I grew up in Mumbai, uh, dreaming of working for NASA and exploring space like Captain Kirk uh, in Star Trek. Uh, had a very successful career in astrophysics and academia before I came to the government about six years ago, and I've primarily worked in program mission and R&D management in astrophysics and earth science. And outside of academia and government, I've had a parallel career on working on inclusion, diversity, and equity. And I continue to do that at NASA, having led the SMD Anti-Racism Action Group and various IDEA initiatives. Uh, super excited to co-chair this with Gemma and work with uh, Nina and Misty and Charu on the Happy ERG. Our main themes for the next year or two are going to be built around two themes. You don't know what you don't know, and you can't be what you can't see. And with that theme in mind of you can't be what you can't see, we decided to launch this series called, which we are calling API Voices Rising. And this is our first, uh, first of hopefully what will be um, a number, number of such events over the, over the next year. And we're delighted to have just an incredibly distinguished panel of speakers today uh, to, to kick off this series. The idea behind the series is to learn about leaders from our API community, learn about them as individuals, learn about their journey and how their ethnicity and identity and intersectional identities influence them positively or negatively. And so we look forward to the stories and the storytelling today from our three guests. Each of them, uh, we asked each of them to speak for about eight to 10 minutes. Uh, while they're speaking, we invite the audience to please uh, feel free to type in your questions into the chat at any time. And we should have about 15 minutes at the end uh, that we will have uh, left for question and answers. So for our distinguished panel, let me just quickly introduce them. I won't give long bios because they'll be talking about their journeys. We have Kei Koizumi, who's the acting director for the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. Bavia Lal, who's the senior advisor for budget and finance at NASA. And Mimi Ong, who's the project manager for the Ingenuity Mars Helicopter, a technology demonstration for the Mars 2020 mission. So thank you very much, Kei, Bavia, and Mimi. Really, really glad to have you. And I'm going to just turn it over to Kay. Uh, uh, we'd love to hear about you and, and, your, and your journey. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you. Happy AAPI Heritage Month. Can you all hear me? Good. So I'm Kay Koizumi. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. So I, I grew up, well, not too far from the Wright Brothers Air Force Museum and not too far from Glenn Research Center. Uh, and um, spent most of my childhood in Columbus, Ohio, except for, you know, summer trips back to Japan, where my parents are from. So all of my grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles, etc., are in Japan. So that's the homeland. Um, I've been in Washington, D.C. now for a long time. I came to D.C. to go to GW for grad school and I've stayed ever since. So I am, um, I'm, I guess I'm a Washingtonian now. And for most of my time in Washington, DC, I've been working in science and technology policy. Uh, that's kind of the area that I ended up loving. Um, I still think of myself as a social scientist and a science policy practitioner. So I've been mostly doing science policy rather than studying it or writing about it, although I've written about it a lot. So my background is primarily in federal research funding. So that's what I've been doing uh, outside of grad school, um, mostly at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. But also uh, for the eight years of the Obama Biden administration, I was at the, the White House Office of Science Technology Policy in a different role from the one I have now. Um, so during those eight years, in many ways, they were the time of my life uh, because I got to work with so many scientists and engineers and technologists at the dozens of federal science agencies that there are. NASA, of course, is one of them. And I'm not going to play favorites, but I always do love NASA. And I've 
was uh, fortunate enough to go to a lot of NASA-related things, including four separate uh, launches during the Obama administration, including the last few of the space shuttle launches. I got to visit several of your centers, um, and I got to visit the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and see the control room, uh, where you know I've most recently seen Mimi, and that's been a, a thrilling experience. Uh, and along the way, I got to meet like fascinating people working in space policy, including Pavia Lal. So it is just so thrilling to be here with uh, my two fellow panelists uh, talking to you about space and aeronautics and space policy. So right now I'm uh, back at the White House Office of Science Technology Policy. I am um, the chief of staff here. And until our director is confirmed, uh, by the Senate. I'm also the acting director. So congratulations, first of all, for NASA for having your administrator, Bill Nelson, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, I'm not going to resent it too much that he was, con uh, con was confirmed far faster than our director has been confirmed, but it'll come. Uh, where let's see. So here I am. I've been really fortunate to, you know, be here on the the ground floor of a, a new administration, and um, I want to tell you that NASA has been a big part of my life because I've had the honor of uh, briefing President Biden on the Mars mission twice. First, when the Perseverance rover landed successfully on on Mars, and then second shortly after the, the first flight of the Ingenuity helicopter. So Mimi probably did not see me, but I was just off stage, just a few feet to the left of the president on both occasions, ready to step in if, uh, if uh, he stumbled at any moment. But of course he didn't. And I know he had wonderful conversations with the JPL team and with everyone on the team. Um, you know, I'm especially thrilled to be here talking to you now during AAPI Heritage Month, because it is an important month for, for me and for most of us here on this call. And, um, you know, I'm old enough that I grew up at a time when it wasn't a thing. And as I said, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, in my high school of 1,200 students, there were four Asian Americans, and two of them were me and my brother. So it wasn't much. Uh, and it was a very different Columbus, Ohio, very different nation than we have right now. Um, and so I really did not grow up with, you know, employee resource groups, with uh, high school clubs for Asian Americans, with, and pretty much without a community, except for the community around Ohio State University, where I grew up, where there were not a whole lot of Asian Americans. There were, of course, lots of Asian students, foreign Asian students and faculty but very few Asian Americans as such. So I really treasure the opportunity to be here with all of you and to support each other as we go through you know, a, a continuing journey of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in this nation. Um, it's an opportunity I see for so many of our fellow Americans to hear these stories that we've been carrying around for a long time, but are not widely known. Uh, in the broader community. And if there's anything good that could come out of the anti-Asian hatred that we've all experienced over the past, well, decades really, but especially over the past year, it's that, you know, we can, we have the opportunity to tell our stories and to make more of our fellow Americans aware of, you know, the, not only our history, but certainly our experience of being Asian uh, in America because it's, it is a very much an untold story. And I do reflect on that, especially uh, this month, because well, at the end of this month for Memorial Day weekend, I am going to see my in-laws in Arkansas. So my husband's family is from Arkansas and they are, well, they're not Asian, they are white and they live in a very predominantly white part of the state. And so it's an opportunity, and this will be my first time actually going by myself uh, without my husband, who is in the Foreign Service. He's in China, so he is not able to come to his hometown. So I'm representing all by myself. But it's an opportunity to say, okay, 
this is what you know being Asian American has been like over the past year. You know, as someone who has been living through well anti-Asian hatred and hate crimes, as someone who has been living through the COVID-19 inspired whatever xenophobia we want we might call it. Um, so it's an opportunity to uh, on this AAPI Heritage Month to kind of bear witness to that. Um, and also to bear witness on some of the joys, the joys of being part of a science technology workforce represented here that is diverse, that is representative of all of that America can be. And so I'm gonna tell stories in addition to some of those incidents, I'm gonna tell stories about uh, moments like this one where I get to talk to and bond with uh, AAPI scientists and engineers working at NASA. So thank you for that opportunity. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks so much, uh, Kay. Uh, uh, I think all of us on the leadership team really resonate with that idea of um, having that opportunity to share our story, especially in the light of all the events with the Atlanta murders happening. Mm -hmm. We had a very interesting speaker uh, earlier in the week, uh, Dr. Angie Dean. Uh, we talked a lot about understanding anti-Asian um, uh, racism and the model minority myth. So before I let you go and turn, turn over to Gemma and Vadia here, I just wanted to ask you one question about your journey. If you could share one thing with your white colleagues, about you, your journey that you have it, that you like, oh, you know, this is a story I, I really wish I told more. What, what, what anecdote would that be? What, what kind of, uh, what, what thing do you, do you feel, you know, uh, you haven't shared, but you would like to? Well, I used to have an answer for that question, but actually the week of the Atlanta murders, you know, I find myself inspired to actually write an all OSTP message. And, you know, I did share some things that I'd never shared before, such as that, you know, Asian Americans, we often have the talk also from our parents about how to navigate being Asian, therefore being perceived as foreign and not of this country. So, I mean, many of my colleagues had not realized that, of course, of course, now people know that Black Americans, their parents have the talk with them. But, you know, Asian parents have to have the talk, a different version, with, um, with kids like me as well. So that was something that I shared that I'd not shared previously. Um, and, well, actually, I probably have a few more stored up. <laughs> uh, well, you know, growing up in, in Columbus, Ohio, and, you know, really resenting my parents for making me, you know, take you know, Japanese bento boxes for lunch. <laughs> Um, now, of course, bento boxes are cool, but uh, back then they were not in Columbus, Ohio. So that's something I've not shared, but I'm saving that for another day. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Kate. I'll turn it over to Gemma. Thank you, Kardik. Um, So for our next speaker, I'd like to um, uh, introduce uh, Acting Chief of Staff, um, Bavia Lal, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Acting Chief of Staff, Bavia Lal, and also now Senior Advisor for um, Budget and Finance to the NASA Administrator. Thanks, Gemma. Uh, I'm now the, uh, can everybody hear me? No. Yes. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, I'm just, just thrilled to be here. Um, uh, I will answer the question that Kartik asked about, sort of, you know, a little bit about myself, how I grew up my family, my childhood. So uh, I was born in Mathura, which is a town near the Taj Mahal. A funny side story, up until I came to the United States at age 18, I had never been to the Taj Mahal. Like when you when you grow up into the shadow of that thing, you don't ever go there, it's for tourists. So one of the first things I did when I went back home after my first uh, year in the United States, I'm like, mom, we have to go to the Taj Mahal. All my friends want to know what it's like and I don't, I don't know how to answer them. Um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so I grew up sort of in the north part of India. I grew up actually in a pretty STEM heavy family. My father was an electrical engineer. Uh, my, uh, my uncles were, his brothers were, uh, were all engineers. Uh, my mom studied math in college, but she got married at uh, 19. She was, um, um, she finished college early, but she didn't have a chance to work or have a career. So a lot of my mom's ambitions went into me, which, you know, I'm sure 
many of you can see that. So, you know, I had a lot of pressure to study and perform well. And a lot of it was my mom's, you know, my mom's goals, uh, which, which, you know, I'm, I'm in retrospect, I'm, 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 I'm happy about. Uh, my father traveled a lot. He was part of the, um, uh, in the 70s when India was developing um, industrially um, and they were trying to set up factories in, in some of the rural parts of, of India where there were tribals. Uh, and so uh, my father would go for multiple months. And, and at one point, I think they decided that uh, my mom and I would travel with him. So my mom would take, you know, go meet my teachers and get the curriculum. And so, I, you know, I would spend three to six months, you know, traveling and living in tribal areas in, in all parts of India, uh, which was, you know, I mean, I cannot imagine a better education than, than that. And, you know, I also did the, you know, the arithmetic and stuff. Uh, but that was kind of a pretty interesting experience that, you know, most, most people of my generation didn't have uh, back in Delhi, which is where. So, so you know, by the time I got to high school, you know, we stopped traveling. I wanted, I wanted to be with my friends. Um, uh, so we lived with our extended family. My grandparents lived with me. My my father's siblings, their families. I don't remember a single meal in my life until I came here, where there were fewer than ten or fifteen people eating with us. Um, I, I grew up with my cousins. In fact, until I was ten or eleven years old, I didn't even know I was an only child. Um, we actually weren't poor by Indian standards, uh, we were, but we were pretty poor by U.S. ones. So growing up, I didn't have a fridge or a telephone or a TV or a car. Uh, things are that, I, that, that are considered standard in American homes. Um, we didn't eat out very much. You know, it was planned. And, and when we went out, you know, it was, you know, you, you know, we would get one ice cream and share that sort of thing. Uh, in fact, when I came to the United States, my father had to borrow money to to buy my plane ticket and to give me some money to supplement my financial aid and loans. Um, and 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 uh, when I, when I went back to India after my freshman year uh, at MIT, my grandmother asked me, you know, how much does milk cost? And you know, at the MIT dorms, milk was free, uh, or at least you know, milk you would put in a coffee was free. You know, how much does butter cost? You know, butter is free. And she's like, oh my goodness, the land of plenty. So, uh, so yeah, so. Uh, so it was, you know, it was a pretty huge change for me to come to the United States uh, as a, as an 18 year old. Um, I mean, I came came from a family. I mean, I think Karthik in your email you had said, you know, talk about some of the values we grew up with. I mean, obviously with you know STEM, in the STEM family education was hugely valued. Doing well academically was really important. Um, and so the so working hard was kind of so core to 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 what my parents taught me that the idea that one is gifted was never brought up. Like, what does it mean? What do you mean gifted? You work hard and you do well. Um, so, so, uh, so this, this, I have, I mean, to this day, I have found this idea that hard work can overcome in, innate advantages. I kind of think of, of, of my superpower. Like I, I'm not intimidated and because I don't think I have to be smart. I just have to work hard. Right. Um, another one sort of huge in our family was sort of humility was a pretty, you know, strong core value. And my grandmother would always say things like, you know, a tree laden with fruits bends down, um, you know. Um, and obviously, humanity is an important uh, value for us. But, you know, I, I, I find that, that the, sometimes there's a downside to it for me. I kind of have a hard time promoting myself. And in this day, day and age, you kind of have to do a little bit of that. So it's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, another sort of challenge, which maybe I am reconsidering sort of culturally, I was brought up not to be disagreeable. Um, and um, uh, as I grow older, though, and, and I used to find that to be sort of, you know, a, a detriment to my career. But as I grow older and as I try to change the status quo here at NASA, I find that maybe this is a bug. I mean, this is a feature, not a bug. So maybe I can, you know, get, you know, with that, that um, um, idiom, you get more, or that proverb, you get more bees with honey than vinegar. Um, so, so I'm hoping that this particular thing that I always thought was a was a drawback for me, maybe it will be helpful for me. Um, so anyway, I mean, I know I'm kind of uh, sort of meandering a little bit. Uh, I arrived in the United States as an 18 year old, two suitcases full of books. I hardly had any clothes. It didn't occur to me to pack clothes. <laughs> uh, and the dream was to study physics and get a Nobel Prize. I was good in school in India. So you can imagine coming to MIT was a rude, rude awakening. Um, I had such major cultural challenges. You know, even though I spoke English, I mean, I was unfamiliar with the accent and even the words. So, for example, for example, in my introduction to nuclear engineering class, the professor talked about 
you know, electrons, protons, neutrons as like pool balls and bowling balls. And, you know, for half a semester, I didn't know what a pool ball was. You know, we called it table tennis. He talked about bowling balls. I, I had never seen a bowling ball, right? Um, uh, you know, so, you know, I knew what billiards was, but, you know, the, the other terms she was using. And, you know, by the time I, I was in, I, there was no internet uh, and I was just too embarrassed to ask questions. So it really affected my ability to learn in the beginning. Uh, another funny example was, um, again, I thought I was a, you know, physics hotshot growing up. And, you know, I knew all about, you know, leptons and bosons and fermions and all of that. But uh, when I came to MIT, there were all these signs everywhere about photons. And I was like, oh my God, how can I call myself, a, you know, somebody who wants to study nuclear physics and I don't know what a photon is. It must be a fundamental particle that was recently discovered and I don't know what it is. Da, da, da. And of course, somebody, you know, told me that, you know, showed me a photon. So, uh, you know, so I, I guess that's a really long way to say that, you know, I had a, I had a hard time adjusting when I came. Um, you know, over time, things got better. I had amazing mentors over the years. You know, I still struggle and I often wonder if I'm seen as part of the team. But, um, you know, every day is, is better. So that's kind of my story. I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm so excited to be here part of this group. Thank you, Pavia. Um, so uh, before we uh, pass it on to um, to Mimi, I do also have a question for you. <laughs> um, listening to what you were saying, enjoyed your story, by the way. Um, you mentioned you had a hard time adjusting, so um, I was wondering if you could share some strategies that you took to overcome some of those cultural norms that you felt like were kind of detrimental to you. Like I think you mentioned humility and um and some other things and i know sometimes being quiet or yeah don't don't uh, rock the boat kind of things um so if you want to share some strategies <laughs> i guess one strategy worth sharing is that just don't be as scared like i was just really nervous to ask a question i think people are a lot more open to answering questions and helping than we think so if I were to, you know, if I were to be giving advice to my 18 year old self, I would ask on day one, what is a futon? <laughs> Instead of trying to, you know, look up books uh, in the library. So that would be one. Another one would be, um, uh, you are, you, I mean, you know, you are who you are. I mean, if you are raised with, you know, being quiet or being just not being disagreeable, I mean, just try to leverage your your innate talents and capabilities and don't try to become somebody else i mean be authentic um and that that would work better than trying to say hey i'm going to be this you know i was raised to be such and such and i'm not going to change my personality and and, and become a different person that's probably not going to serve you very well so try to kind of channel your you know what what are your core strengths um that would be kind of two things i would i would tell myself um Thank you so much, Pavia. Um, so for our next speaker, I'll turn it over to Nina Wang. Thank you, Gemma. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, who is Mimi Ong. And she is currently the project manager for the Ingenuity Mars Helicopter, a technology, technology demonstration of the Mars 2020 mission. So without further ado, I'll introduce Mimi. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And I'm very excited to be here um, uh, with Pavia and Kay. It's an honor to be here. Um, I've been at uh, NASA uh, JPL for 30 years, so don't do the math. Uh, I must have come before I was born. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, I, I have a lot of overlap with Pavia, so I apologize, but you're Punchlines are exactly what I wanted to share today. Um, I was born uh, in the U.S. on the University of uh, Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I grew up on the campus because my parents were foreign students uh, from Burma, you know, from Myanmar, doing their PhDs there. So literally, you know, I grew up in the graduate student housing. And when they finished their PhDs, when I was about two years old, uh, they went back to their home country, right, Myanmar. And so that's where I grew up my formative years from two to about 11 and a half. And so uh, that's where I, you know, was, those are the formative years. That's where you learn the culture and, you know, of, uh, Bobby just talked about it. And it's, I want to stay on that a little bit, you know, because they're about being respectful, being polite, you know, we bow in front of adults, you know, we don't talk back. Uh, everybody older than us, we are just respectful for, by definition. 
being humble is part of it. You know, my parents, I, I was, I've always, always, always academically strong. You know, that's something I love, but they never told me I was good at school. And I just one time overheard them whispering to their neighbor how good my grades were. That's the kind of humbleness I grew up around. You know, I was never told I was doing well. And just being grateful is all a part of it. And I wanted to say that because, you know, that comes back to play later. Uh, along that, I got the foundational education in Burma. So I still do my math tables in Burmese, you know. So uh, with that, um, when we I was about 11 and a half, uh, my family moved to um, Malaysia. My parents are both professors. You know, my mother in math, you know, PhD, so she professors in math and my father in food science, a special branch of chemistry. So again, like Bavia, a very uh, technical uh, family I always grew up in. So when we moved to Malaysia, uh, it was the first time that I was exposed to now a totally new culture, you know, after 11. And it was eye opening and I really loved it because at that age, you know, the Malaysian culture and in Malaysia, they celebrate everything. You know, there were the Muslim holidays, no school, you know, uh, Hindu holidays, no school, you know, Chinese holidays, no school, Christmas, no school, you know, and on top of it, I was sent to international schools. And so again, I met all the kids from all the other countries. And in fact, at uh, the first few days of school, you know, three weeks, 11 years old, you pick up language very fast. I couldn't even speak English very well by then, because in Burma, we didn't speak English, right? You know, we, we spoke Burmese. And so just getting into a school with a bunch of international kids and really learning English on the fly, you learn all the cultures simultaneously, right? And so I grew up with really celebrating all the cultures. In the meantime, that educational foundation that I started, you know, in Burma, we built on really well in Malaysia. And so I moved forward. So when I was 16, my parents sent me back, uh, you know, they were still staying back in Asia. They sent me back to Illinois. Uh, as a senior in high school, you know, again, our education was everything. Uh, I have two sisters, so the three of us are, are you know, education is everything to them. So they said, okay, also time is money because they had to save their, all their money to make sure the kids had education. Time's money, so they said, you'll be a senior. So I was a 16 year old senior in high school, uh, went to Blue Mount, Illinois, um, very, very small town. And so it was a very, um, you know, again, a, a totally new culture, right? I'm going from five degrees latitude to now about 40 degrees latitude. So weather is completely different. You know, you're going from the tropics to snow and ice. Uh, the kids have all been together since, uh, you know, kindergarten, you know, so to get into, to meld into that uh, was again, really eye opening. And of course, you know, it's American culture that, you know, I hadn't been, but I always heard about, but never was exposed to. And of course, high school culture, which itself is a cult culture on its own. And so again, I uh, dived in and, you know, got, got, you know, myself settled and it, it was a great high school. You know, of course there were, um, you know, some challenging times, but mostly really exciting and fun, fun times. And every step of the way I felt anchored because to me, education is something I love. So I, I always say, you know, anchor back to something. And I always love school. So once you have something you're anchored in, you make, you know, friends off of that and, you know, things like that. So from there, I went on to uh, University of Illinois, right where I was uh, born and back to uh, U of I campus. And I was a 17 year old freshman and, uh, you know, finished my bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering. Again, a whole nother culture, like freedom like you've never had before, you know, <laughs> you're in college, like parents don't know, like nobody, no adults know you're on your own. And, but again, itself was a cultural shock. And again, so many majors and so many, you know, kids just free, being free. And I've always loved every step of it. Okay. So then after that, uh, I came to uh, NASA JPL, uh, started in the deep space network on the ground systems where the block five receiver was the first digital receiver that was going in. So I got to really practice my signal processing communications that I learned in school and learn what it took to make work. So I started from the algorithms, but my first supervisor, Ernie Stone, was so good at grooming. Like, you know, besides the algorithms, he, you know, he gave all of us room to now follow it to testing and delivering it to the three sites across the world and really learn what it took to take algorithms into, you know, what people like different disciplines implement to really how to make it work and how do you deliver it into the system. And from there, you know, my career blossomed. And then, you know, I went from ground system to space spacecraft side and, uh, you know, and then today, you know, Ingenuity Mars helicopter project manager, what an honor, right? Never would have been able to imagine that. So I think in summary, I feel like I've been groomed uh, to like, you know, really grow up in different cultures but, you know, being um, 
uh, fortunate enough to have a culture that I was kind of groomed with, but then in a young enough age, shown to so many cultures and as kids, you just don't see boundaries, right? You just talk and you're like, oh my God, like you do this in your country, you eat this, like you drink this, right? So I feel like I've been groomed in that. And so I've benefited and I get excited. Like when I get into new projects, I'm meeting, you know, new people like this conversation, you know, everywhere, I guess my reaction has been excitement, you know, because I want to know what is your point of view? Like, well, it's different or it's very similar. And so I think that's, you know, so, and it's gone all the way to, you know, even the making of the Mars helicopter, right? We, I thought I was quite open-minded, but when we were limited with that 1.8 kilogram vehicle, I saw like aspects of other technical disciplines that I had, I hadn't thought beyond a certain level, you know, where you realize that the absolute diversity is the only way that you can crack this nut. And so I absolutely really believe in kind of really understanding where everybody's coming from, it's fun to hear it. And sometimes we have tremendous arguments because, you know, they are so different. But if you have the common goal, you really get through it in a way. So that's the positive side. Uh, I think uh, Kartik had asked, you know, share a bit of also the challenges. And I think the, the challenges I really wanted to, for me, was um, this kind of respectful, politeness, humble, gratefulness. And this feeling of I'm imposing, you know, it's just something that comes in the way we come come up, which is, I don't think that feeling is present in the Western world. <laughs> and so I think overcoming that is easier said than done. And so I think that was really hard. And so, uh, you know, over time, I learned like, you know, people, I'm like, I have something to say. Wow, like this idea I had, I thought everybody knew, like, who am I? Like, I came from, you know, all this part, I'm just me. And having that confidence to speak up and to kind of, you know, not only speak up, but, you know, really contribute. And then even to then later transform to leading and managing, you know, projects or, you know, organizations, you know, of technical organizations, things like that that I've done. So I think that's been the challenge and it took me a long time. So I guess it would be best if it doesn't take the net generation, not as long as it took me. Um, one of two tricks, I so to speak, I have uh, for, to do that are one, mentors, mentors, mentors. I think, again, Bobby had mentioned that too. You know, the talking to folks uh, from your own culture, but also from all the other culture, like from the majority, you know, culture, as well as minority, because you learn, like for me, you know, my parents' family that took me in to let me go to high school, they helped me with the transition to the American culture, right? Or the professors at, you know, universities. So when I came to JPL NASA, just grabbing managers who, you know, I said, oh, I like the way that decision was made, kind of having courage to step up. And then then you learn exactly, I think what Bobby said, it's like, everybody's more than happy to share. So grab mentors, you know, and, and just of all areas. And then the last tr thing that I always have is, even now, I always have this, even though it might not seem like it, <laughs> because I am more outspoken now, um, what I do do is I do make everything very focused and goal oriented. So I think I tend to get a lot of my reservations by goal orient, you know, like with Mars helicopter, we, if we didn't build it soon enough, we weren't going to catch a ride on Perseverance Rover. They can go without us. They don't need us. Right. So it's like, okay, I have to speak up. I have to lead. The team has to be coherent. Same thing when I was managing a section on guidance and control, you know, it's like, okay, this is great. This is what we do, but what do we want the future to be? You know, what technologies are needed in the future so that we don't just stay status quo, right? And really focusing that helps me then forget about, you know, most of this reservation that you kind of are built in to have, and then reach out to the program offices, reach out to, you know, calls for proposal, you reach out for new proposals to say, this is where we are. And, you know, this is why we need a seat at the table so that we can be right there with you to define the future. So uh, those are my general uh, advice and would love to talk more about, uh, you know, on the subject. And thank you so much, Mimi. Um, and I did have one question for you, but then I saw your bookshelves behind you and I'm a big reader. So I wanted to also ask what you're currently reading. And then in addition to that, um, you know, you, you talk a lot about how you were exposed to a lot of different cultures growing up and uh, different types of people. And so what advice would you give to those who, you know, maybe they don't grow up around um, people with different cultures and different backgrounds and, you know, how they go about moving through their life and career, um, being able to take on those skills and learn how to work on a team with different types of people? 
Yeah, so yeah, I got distracted about what I've been reading because I have not been able to read <laughs> with the Mars helicopter. So I'm, I need to now pick a book because I finally have time. <laughs> so I'll have to get back on to, to you for the. There is a recent book that I big, uh, picked up, uh, Principles. I think that that one uh, that uh, I think I've started that I haven't finished yet. So, um, but in terms of. Uh, yeah, I think you, you, sorry, I was very distracted by your book <laughs> because I'm like, what am I, I haven't read it because it, um, because it really does go back to, to make things happen. You know, you really have to be very focused and you have to, you know, really focus. So in terms of uh, developing your career, right, I think you're saying in terms of, uh, I, I think first and foremost, um, I think trust the system. I think there are people who are willing to help and you are really capable. And I think, um, Feel empowered, I think, to reach out and, you know, like, so, so first of all, I think you have to find a field, you know, that you're good in and that you love and then find an intersection of an area that you make a difference in. And so I think I heard what about uh, being yourself, right, being genuine, right? And what do you want to really push? Okay. Once you get there, I think you get anchored. So for me, like I said, you know, as I was saying, school all the way was something I anchored to until I found, you know, you know, JPL I worked in, I believe in all the missions that are being pursued. So I didn't have anything else that was I was mentally doubtful about, right? So you want to really follow that. Uh, second is then just don't don't second guess yourself. And I think majority of the people, yes, there are a lot of differences that have to be worked out. I think a lot of the people who have helped me along the way are, you know, Asian as well as you know Caucasian and African American, and I mean so and so many levels. You know, they're managers, they're peers, but they're team members and just general folks. So I think it's, it is most important to to be focused, be objective. Uh, and we also have to maybe have a little bit of a thicker skin, you know, which is not how I was <laughs> brought up, you know, so have to learn a little bit and let some of the things go that don't matter, but stick to the things that do matter. But most importantly, I think it's very important to feel empowered to speak up. You know, if you have something to say that is really important, don't hold yourself back and make your mission happen. And I think there are a lot of people who are there to help and do the right thing. Thank you so much, Mimi. Um, and I will now pass it over to Misty. Um, I believe she has a question. Thank you, Nina. Thanks so much to the panel. That was um, that was really great. It was great to hear about your your backgrounds and your journeys a little bit. Um, so I kind of have a an, an easy, fun question, and I'll start with Mimi. Um, could you tell us about someone that has inspired you in your career? And you know, they could be famous or they could be, you know, someone from your family or coworker and, and maybe just, you know, tell us why they are inspirational to you. Um, yeah, you know, I was thinking about that question and I think it isn't, I think one person in one's life, it really is a lot of people. And so for me, I have to give the credits to my parents, really, you know, they uh, gave up all you know personal luxury all of that to make sure that education is something they gave to their children you know all three of us and i think having grown up in that and growing up in a place that education is just something you do you know and there isn't even an idea of you don't have education you know it just wasn't around so i think that's the first uh inspiration and also the idea that they never doubted that i was going to do something with my education right so I think that confidence that they give, and my grandmother too, since I was little, just was confident. It just there was no doubt when she, you know, looked at me like I was going to do something one day, and you know, and so I think that's where it starts. But as you go along the way, I've met so many people that I've said like, oh, I like the way you know she did it, or you know, uh, for example, um, Leslie Lisse, you know, at JPL, like she was a project manager, I was on her uh, project, and I was like, oh, okay, you know, I'll go talk to her, and how does she do that, you know, and then. She mentored me through the year or my first supervisor, Ernie Stone, right? Like I said, he taught like he didn't just let me stay in my box of algorithms. You know, he took me all the way to the lab like, hey, you know, these technicians who are board building this, this is what happened. This is how I get in case all the way to these are the subsystem people to these are how we test. Right. And to respect everyone. So along the way, many, many names come along where you see people that you admire and then, you know, you talk to them some more. And you know yeah. they advise you, so I it think takes, that's, it takes a village, right? Yeah, it really takes a village. So I have a long list of names that I would really <laughs> like to acknowledge. 
What about K? Are you talking K? K, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, well, I approach it a little bit differently because, you know, I realize I haven't really had many mentors um, who really spoke to all of me. So I've, well, maybe just like me, I've had to like assemble mentorship from many pieces. And of course it started with my parents. My parents are scientists and engineers. Well, a scientist uh -huh. and a, a doctor. And so they certainly inspired me to, well, essentially get out of Ohio <laughs> and find my <laughs> way in the world. Um, they may have regrets about that part, but, uh, um, and so they were my original mentors. And then I've had to like pick up mentorship in pieces because, you know, I have been mentored mostly by, by straight white men, right? And so <laughs> career mentorship I can get from them. But in, I needed to find other people to whom I could turn for how to be an, you know, Asian American professional, how to make mm -hmm. my way. Um, I needed to find, you know, other people to mentor me in how to be openly gay within a science and engineering enterprise. Um, and I'm not sure I ever made a complete package of all of that. So that's mm -hmm. why I think it's important for me and Pavia and Mimi to be here uh, for all of you who are mostly younger than we are, uh, to, to let you know that we want to be here for you, to, you know, give you some of the, the experiences and the, the opportunities for mentoring that we didn't have. Okay, now what about Bavia? Yeah, so I mean, my answer is pretty similar to, uh, to Mimi and Kay. You know, my parents were a huge inspiration. Actually, for me, my daughter, uh, was a pretty big inspiration since she was little. So when she was very little, you know, it really helped me sort of, I wanted to be with her, but I also wanted to work. So it helped me really cut to the core. So I became a more efficient worker because I knew I wanted to go spend time with her. So she kind of, she inspired me to be, you know, be very judicious with, you know, what I did and when, and so, you know, you, 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 you don't learn really to say no, especially as, as a woman from, from Asian culture. So, that was kind of one of the ways I started to say, no, no, this is something and I want to be with my child. Um, but in terms of other mentors, again, uh, uh, inspirations, you know, my bosses have been and, and like Kay's, they've all been straight white men, but I've been extraordinarily lucky that they have promoted me. Um, one inspiration I've had, and it's a person I've only met once, um, uh, is, is uh, again, sort of a little bit of a cliche, but it is the truth, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, I mean, she's just, what an extraordinary woman, you know, doing things at a time when it was not okay for women to speak of things as she did. And about a year ago, I had a pretty scary health crisis. And, um, you know, anytime I felt sorry for myself, I was like, you know, this woman at age 87 has gone through three sets of cancers and she still comes to work every day. I mean, so it just kind of reminds you, you know, that there's people like her and who, who will who are changing and 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 will continue to change the world. So that makes you feel a little bit strong, more strongly about you know what your contribution to the world has to be. So those are kind of the the people I thought about. Um, and again, every day. I mean, I'm inspired by Mimi Young. I mean, one of the things she said uh, after the the Ingenuity flight was, you know, we had a Wright Brothers moment. Let's get back to work. I was like, wow. That's a work ethic. I, I was blown away, uh, and I will forever be a, a, forever be a, a big worshiper of Mimi's. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna pass it back to Kartik. Great, thanks so much. Wow, um, I wish we could uh, speak for the entire day today. There's so many so many fantastic uh, stories and questions I want to ask. I'm going to ask one very quick one, and then uh, I think we have a few in the chat, especially one from Laura. And so, Laura, if you can stay on, it would be great if you could, um, when I when I call on you to uh, unmute yourself and and ask that question. I have a question um, in the in the context of where we are today. You know, this past year has seen a national reckoning with racial inequities in our in our nation, and I just wanted to ask all three of you if you could briefly talk about in what ways do you see the fate of our community, the AAPI community, tied together with other marginalized community? And how do we, how can we better work together for, for a brighter future for the nation? And uh, 
I don't know. Let's go with Bavia first, since we, <laughs> and then we'll go to Kay. I was afraid. So this was this is one where I sort of I'm totally out of my depth. Um, I, I think as Asian Americans, we are kind of seeing the model minority, um, and we are really kind of at least culturally shown to be different than other minority groups. So I think the fact that you know the question you specifically asked is the one to ask. You know, we are all in the same boat together, and how do we navigate the waters together? Um, so I would say the one thing we need to start to do, and um, you know, me first of all, is really not think of Asian Americans as that as that sort of different kind of group. Our issues are different because at the at the very core they aren't as different. So I think it's a it, we, we individually need to change our mental models of our fit in society. That's kind of the one thing I have sort of action item for myself. Uh, I'll let Kay and, and Mimi take the hard parts of that question. <laughs> I think I'm going to dodge the hard parts of that because then we really could be here all day talking about, you know, how we stand in allyship with other marginalized communities. Um, but I think, you know, speaking as we are during AAPI Heritage Month, you know, first step is to actually, you know, acknowledge for ourselves fully our heritage as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, I admit, I don't know all of this. I'm still discovering so much of, you know, our shared experiences in this nation for myself, because it's, it's often observed, right, that, you know, back in the homelands, I mean, Asia is a pretty big place. The Pacific is a pretty big place. So we wouldn't necessarily see each other as having anything in common if we were still, you know, in our grandparents' um, native lands. But we are here uh, in America and we do share a lot. Um, some of it is, well, some of it is by accident, right? Because people perceive us as being more alike than our parents really were. Uh, but some of it is because we we actually do have a shared heritage and culture in America. And maybe for this month, that's an opportunity for us to recognize that. And then maybe we can be better in following months of figuring out, well, how does our community relate relate to and stand in allyship with other communities here in America? So I'm going to celebrate my Japanese-ness this month. And... Whatever that means, I still don't know what that means, but I hope we can figure it out together. Thanks, Kay. Mimi? Yeah, I, I think, again, I want to repeat what Kay said. I think you don't have to give up your culture, right? Um, but I think, again, and I, I think it's more about understanding other people's culture and also getting the other cultures to understand you. and. Once that happens, there is that magic. I think as I was sharing the way I, just because of the age it happened to me, right? It was just a teenage years that were, when things were so much open. I think the brains are so open-minded. If we can get to that kind of discussion and celebrating each other's cultures, we can do so much more than what we can individually. So I, I think that's the main thing. You know, what can we do so that like, uh, the, you know, Kay had mentioned, a lot of, most of the mentors are, you know, family friends that have helped, you know, our family, right, settle, are Caucasian Americans who's, you know, multiple generations who have been in the United States, right? And so it is there, that unity and working together is there. Uh, and, you know, and they've always loved, you know, they've always like, you know, oh, this is how, you know, what food you like and let's try it. And this is what we eat. And so there is so much openness there. I think we just have to find a way to expand that connection that already exists. So I really want to, again, you know, advance, get mentors or get conversations with not just your own culture, but all the other cultures and the majority. And uh, I think that I, I'm hopeful. I think there's room for conversation and getting something really good, you know. Great. Thanks, Mimi. We have about five minutes left, so I'm going to, I apologize to the audience. We didn't have time for a mm -hmm. lot of questions, but Laura, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. This has Hi. been excellent. Um, my question actually relates to the topic you were just discussing, um, and I'm curious if you've ever experienced any pushback, any of you, any pushback from your family or for folks that have stayed in, you know, your home country, uh, whichever one that might be, when they observe you now and maybe you've adopted, you know, cultural traits or some other behaviors from some of the other cultures you've been experiencing, do you ever get pushback that you're maybe 
you know, watering down your core heritage or something like that. That's been something I've been observing. So it was oh, crazy. Yeah. I'm going to raise my hand and say yes. <laughs> well, in many ways, because, I mean, look at me, talk to me. I don't really, I'm not Japanese anymore, if I ever was. So that becomes pretty clear because actually I was just in Japan over the weekend because Japan was hosting the Arctic Science Ministerial. And, you know, I was the head of the U.S. delegation. But here's, you know, Kei Koizumi, Japanese sounding name, you know, and I realized, well, yeah, I mean, none of those, none of the Japanese on the screen uh, would mistake me for a Japanese person, because not only, even if I were talking in Japanese, I mean, I've adopted, you know, the cultural traits of growing up in Ohio with all of you <laughs> in America. Um, so... And I think my family now recognizes that. I mean, I'm their American cousin, even though I look like them. Um, so, uh, and that's fine. It, there have been tensions over the years, um, but you know, now I think every, we've all come to this point where we recognize you know, what we share, but also the experiences that we will never have in common because they grew up in one place and I grew up somewhere else. La Laura, I would just, I, I would agree with what Kay said. Uh, I think I, I get, I used to get that a lot. Oh my God, you're becoming American. And I would go visit my family in India. And it, it was not a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the early days, it exactly it would it would burn me. I would like feel something in the back of my neck, and I'd be like, no, you know, I'm still Indian. Um, but I think as I have grown over years, over the years, I mean, I've, I've you know, I'm proud to keep my Indian heritage, but also take on American traits. And now, you know, when somebody says I'm, Amer I'm American, I'm actually proud of it because I think I've been able to amalgamate myself into a person that builds on all of these great heritages. And um, so it's 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 growth on my part as well as that of my family. <laughs> and I'm, I'm proud of, you know, the person I have become over the years. But it, it was a process. Mimi, would you like to add anything? Not as much because I've been pretty sheltered. Uh, you know, we have a very small family here and I have not been as exposed. So I I, I, I tend to be totally, uh, <laughs> I think all I do is work and my immediate family. So I, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, I, I don't have anything to share. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I know there were more questions that people had, but I really want to respect the time, especially um, for everybody at, at this meeting. So. Thank you, Mimi, Bavia, and Kay, so much for sharing your stories with us and spending this hour with us. We hope you'll join us again soon and we can continue this conversation. Uh, I, we re really enjoy getting to know you. Thank you to the audience for all your fantastic comments. Uh, we will try to preserve them and share them in case uh, our panelists didn't get a chance to see them. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thanks so much.